This interview is being conducted at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library in Simi Valley, California. Today's date is October 12, 2015. My name is Dan Pemberton and I'm being assisted by Mr. Ken Sobel as photographer. This interview is part of the Veterans History Project sponsored by the Library of Congress. Today we are interviewing Mr. Art Hernandez, a veteran of the Korean War. Art, please state your full name, date, and place of birth. Uh, February, uh, my name is Arthur Hernandez, or Art Hernandez, and I was born on February the 23rd of 1930. And where? Uh, in Hayden, Arizona. Hayden, Arizona. Could you please give us a little information about your family background? Yes, um, my mother was a refugee uh, from, uh, she came fleeing the revolution of 1910 in Mexico along with her father and her brother. Uh, her mother died on, on the way because they came from the middle of Mexico walking all the way to El Paso, Texas. Um, along the way, uh, they ate rabbits and a green that grows in the desert uh, called verdolagas. I don't know what the English uh, name is for it, but it has a lot of food value, uh, like spinach. But um, uh, their biggest problem was water and they would go into villages or towns to get water and then keep walking. And along, her, along the way she lost her mother to starvation and then her sister. Uh, they did make it to El Paso and were admitted as uh, refugees. My father came from uh, much, south, uh, much, much more south of uh, the middle of Mexico uh, he came from Jalisco, Mexico, and he was 16 years old and was uh, what is now called an undocumented or illegal alien. Uh, he came on top of a boxcar uh, that crossed uh, a train that crossed the border and uh, eventually met my mother and they were married uh, in 1929. Do you have any memories of your early childhood and early education? Um, yes. Um, the, we, we attended a, a small school and um, uh, the, there was a day when the parents came and I was singled out to go and demonstrate what uh, they were teaching. and. Um, uh, I was uh, told to write my name and my mother said I took the whole board to write my name. <laughs> and that's what I remember of elementary school. Oh, the other thing I remember also is that in the morning we were taken to a separate room and given a pint of milk and some graham crackers. It was during the Depression. What was the Depression like for your family? Um, well, uh, like most people of that time, we were very poor, and the government used to give us uh, menudo, which to this day I don't I don't like, uh, because the menudo was given fresh with all of the the green stuff still in it, and I would take it home and then hose it down before my mother could cook it, and my father would cook cook it up. Uh, the other thing they gave us is um, some pants uh, and shirts with a black and green stripe and a very dark green color that I couldn't stand. And my mother would cut them up and make blankets out of them. But um, that was my memory of those years. Where were you living at that time? Was this in El Paso where your, your parents no, came uh, to? No, it was in Hayden, Arizona. Okay where I was born. And according to my birth certificate, I imagine I was born in, um, at home because there was no hospital in the city and only one medical doctor. So you went to high school in Hayden, Arizona, or not? 
I went through uh, seventh grade in uh, Hayden, Arizona, okay. and then my mother and father separated, and uh, my mother uh, earned a uh, hundred dollars um, ironing clothes, and she decided to come and see if uh, what things were like in California. So we took the train and arrived here in uh, Los Angeles after midnight when there were no buses and um, of course uh, no transportation to San Fernando and uh, a guy came up and offered to bring us to San Fernando for $39 out of the hundred that my mother had so one third of it uh, disappeared on that first night. Oh my goodness. So you went you finished your schooling. This was when you're seventh grade. You said so. You finished your schooling in San Fernando Valley. Uh, I went to San Fernando High School, and uh, since uh, our school was uh, in Hayden was very small, San Fernando High School consisted of several buildings. And uh, the young man who took me there uh, took me upstairs to get his books out of his locker, and then left when the bell rang, and I didn't know how to get downstairs. <laughs> I, I I got lost. Uh, I got lost in the school on the very first day. <laughs> Eventually, I found myself to the registration office. <laughs> <laughs> um, San Fernando Valley High School. What did did you do? Any sports? Did you hit, belong to any clubs? Any activities in high school? Yes, I, I uh, played football, both varsity and uh, and B the B thing. But I was hurt at the very start of the season. Uh, one time, I think they broke my ribs. And the other, I, I don't remember exactly what happened, but in both cases, I was out the entire season for both the, the teams. Uh, I excelled in, in art. And um, I, I recalled... Um, being asked if I was going to go to college and that was like asking me do you want to go to the moon and of course uh, that was so out of uh, out of my thinking that I said no so it was very typical to be put into the industrial arts section but uh, my father had always been very um, uh, conscious of his tools and he didn't want me to touch them so I didn't know what a pair of pliers was or what a wrench was. And so I didn't do well in the industrial arts section. And where I did uh, excel was in the print shop. And uh, the instructor there was more than um, just a teacher of printing. He was um, like a father figure that talked to us about etiquette uh, and a lot of other things that I don't remember but but he was very special. You graduated? Uh, I was a member also of the Knights Club okay. um, which was the sort of uh, high grades uh, students. Uh, some of those are now lawyers and one of them um, Laird Facey now has the facing clinics in the northern part of San Fernando. Oh my goodness. So you were a very good student. Well, I think I was. Uh, I, I was doing all right. Uh, not not an A student, maybe more C's and B's, but for some reason, uh, people always see me as uh, as a leader. I, I don't know what it is, but. Uh, I was president of the Hispanic group uh, mm -hmm. called Los Caballeros. Um, I did um, I did drama, and then uh, uh, there was a, a teacher that the kids used to make fun of. She was elderly, and uh, she taught English. And I wrote something one day. And she was highly impressed with it. And later on in college, I was told that I write very well. And uh, it has continued. 
up until recently where where I tend to forget words. Wonderful. That's that's wonderful. When did you graduate from high school? Uh, in winter of 1949. So then what did you do right after high school? I went to work at uh, the San Fernando Sun distributing type and then uh, the San Fernando Sun, uh, Sun sold and I started working in a ceramic factory in um, uh, what is now it's right next to the uh, airport, the Van Nuys Airport. And um, at that time, there was a very large uh, ceramics industry, uh, but they didn't adapt to what we could do uh, because the Japanese came in with their pottery and they were masters and they could do much better than we, we could. So they all died. And I worked in that until I got drafted. And I was drafted in uh, February of 1952. And the letter that normally gives you 30 days was, um, I went to different addresses because by that time I had gotten married and moved. And so when the letter arrived, uh, it was a letter that uh, said I had to report that day at uh, Washington Boulevard. Uh, so I asked my brother to get me a razor blade and uh, some toothbrushes, and we went down to uh, Washington. Um, I passed the physical at 1A, and then the sergeant who was in charge did something that I think to this day was totally illegal. He said, um, a couple of the guys have jumped ship and uh, I'll be damned if Uncle Sam's gonna pay for those empty seats. So I'm gonna close my eyes and I'm gonna point a finger at uh, two guys who are going to go tonight. And he went like this and I was on the very front row so I was the first one. And um, they finally got on the train with another guy uh, named Tom Hansen from Van Nuys. And there was no seats because it was just full of duffel bags. So Tom Hansen and I stood in the, in the middle of the train with all these duffel bags talking to each other all the way to Fort Ord. Is that where you went to basic training? Huh? Is that where you went to basic training, Fort Ord? I uh, know what happened was they processed us there gave us a series of written tests and gave us the uniforms and then put your civilian clothes in a box and uh, ship them home. And um, uh, we arrived uh, about probably right after midnight and then they came into the barracks and said, okay, it's time for breakfast. And the moon was still out and it was three o'clock in the morning because there was such a huge line uh, of men and I remember very c clearly that they were cracking eggs into this big bowl and every once in a while one egg would be bloody but they'd mix it all up and then they would cook it and then just throw it on your on your tray and uh, it was a, a very interesting introduction into military service. <laughs> oh and of course uh, they also give you the haircut, and uh, the barbers have a great sense of humor. They say, how do you like it? And like, Just take a little hair and I'll trim it on the back. Oh, good. And they just run the clippers until you're totally bald. And we made fun of each other because um, some of the guys had really long hair. And after they took off every, everything off, you couldn't recognize them. <laughs> Was this at Fort Ord, or did you go from Fort Ord to... Uh, from Fort Ord, I was sent to Camp Roberts, okay. which I thought was, uh, was wonderful. I'm still in California, mm -hmm. and um, still knew what sunshine was like, and uh, the beautiful weather here. So uh, I went through basic training, and once again, for some odd reason, I was recommended for uh, leadership school. Uh, I went to leadership school <clears throat> and uh, 
There were two things I remember uh, that still happens to this day. Uh, your shoulders are supposed to be squared, but my shoulder tends to drip a little bit on the left-hand side. I don't know, and maybe because of the harvesting that we did as farm workers where you have a, a very heavy buckets that you carry with the, with the tomatoes or the cucumbers. But um, the officer would say, straighten out that shoulder, straighten out that shoulder. <laughs> and then the other thing I remember was when they taught us about unarmed combat, uh, the officer came by and uh, he went and he picked me out and uh, took me out on the, on the sand pit. And then he said, uh, uh, hit me. Well, you know, I don't know the guy, and he's an officer, and you know, I just, you know, I just barely, you know. And he looked at me, and he said, "I said, hit me," and then he slapped me really hard. And then I turned around and tried to let one go as hard as I can because I was angry. And then he put his foot right here, that buried the metal buttons that they were imprinted on my chest. He did it so hard. And then he pulled my arm up, threw me over over his head. I landed on the on the sand, and he put his foot right here. I thought, oh my gosh, you know. And then he picked me up, and then he showed some more moves. Uh, and I was just a, 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 a burlap bag as far as he was concerned. I was just being thrown all over. At the end of the session, he said, um, why didn't you fight back? I said, I, I didn't know how. And he said, what were you in civilian life? I said, I was an art student. I was drafted from college. And he said, oh, he says, I was a music major. So uh, he said, um, after the drills and all that, come out and I'll, I'll, I'll help you out. So every afternoon after spending a whole day in the drills or the classroom, I would go out and um, he, he would cheat me, teach me how to handle myself. Um, my MOS or military occupational specialty is light infantry weapons and unarmed combat. And I think that's maybe where that came from. Was this part of basic training or was this part of your leadership course? It's part of the leadership course. Um, <laughs> Oh, another thing and I all remember. all of this was at Camp Roberts? <laughs> uh, at Camp Roberts. Another thing I remember was um, the bayonet uh, drills. Um, the, uh, the enlisted man that was at the, uh, uh, on a big stand that gave us our directions, he had this very gruff voice, and he had a scar right, right on his neck, and he would point to it, say, this is what a bayonet does, you know. And, well, we all believed it, and we went through it, and um, finally at the very end, uh, one of the sergeants told us, no, nah, he had a thyroid surgery. <laughs> so we spent all that, t all that time believing it. <laughs> Were you given... Uh, any kind of a promotion after this leadership course? No. no? Um, I was sent home for the 30-day leave, or less than that, I think. And my wife, my new wife, was uh, very sick. And so most of that time was spent uh, with her. And um, <coughs> finally uh, left and uh, went to uh, Pittsburgh, California. And then from there we were shipped to... Um, down to the Golden Gate and boarded a ship. I had never been uh, in a ship. Uh, I had never seen one. So when they opened the doors of the big warehouse, I looked at that thing and I thought, that is absolutely huge. <laughs> and uh, we, uh, there must have been several thousand men on the ship and right after we crossed the Golden Gate Bridge, there was a storm. And that ship was tossed around like a tin can in the ocean. 
everybody was seasick. I had an orange and some crackers and I had the top bunk and a porthole. So I, I sat up there and ate that orange and crackers a little bit at a time for almost three days until we got to uh, calm seas. And from then on, it was calm all the way to uh, Yokohama, Japan. No stop in Hawaii along the way? No. Uh, so and then from Japan Yokohama, first. we went to a base. And there were at least 3,000 men and a big t uh, tower with a loudspeaker. And then um, it was raining, pouring rain. And my name was called along with one other. Out of those 3,000 men, why in the world did they call my name as a PFC? And uh, I went to, uh, to the barracks, and then an officer came up and asked me if I could type. Yes, I could type, and that was it. Uh, next, next day, um, we boarded the train back to uh, uh, the, the port, and then we boarded the ship and started to cross the, uh, is that the Sea of Japan? And uh, it was during winter, uh, and the sea was green, the ship was covered with ice, and um, uh, there were ropes all over it so you could grab to go to, uh, to the galleys for uh, lunch, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I went up on the on one day I was hungry, and um, I took one breath, and I thought I was going to die. I, I've never been in cold weather. So I've never been in the snow. I've never been back east. In fact, when I was drafted, the furthest I had ever been was from Hayden, Arizona, to San Fernando, from San Fernando to Los Angeles, and that was my whole range. So um, I took that breath of that cold air. I said, no way. <laughs> and then I'm allergic to lamb. And one, when it finally came time to, the, the ship settled a little bit, I went down to uh, have lunch, I think it was. And uh, the Navy is the only one that's, that serves lamb. I don't think the Air Force does, does it? I don't think so. Uh, well, um, they had this beautiful beef stew, and I thought, ah, oh, this is perfect. And I remember taking the fork and taking a carrot out of there, putting it in my mouth, and all I tasted was that lamb, and I headed for the stairs to go throw up outside. So you knew bef before this that you were allergic to lamb. <laughs> huh? You knew before the oh, yeah. incident that Ever you were allergic. Ever since I was a child. Oh, I, goodness. <laughs> lamb, was, lamb was not for me. Um, okay, so you're on the ship from Japan to Korea, middle of the winter. Were you, were you dressed for that? Did they have you with warm clothing and everything? Uh, they gave us uh, winter clothing. Uh, I had a parka by that time, uh, parka boots, mm -hmm. and uh, I remember when we got to Pusan, there's a very busy port, uh, hundreds of men, tons of materials uh, stacked up, and uh, a lot of Koreans doing work. And then we were immediately put onto a train, and the train headed us north, and there was another train coming south. And on that southern train were trucks that were uh, had been bombed or shut up. There were tanks that were mangled completely. And I said to myself, there must be some monster up there doing all of that. Uh, but uh, on the way up, uh, we saw the children, the orphans, and uh, we would throw candies out at them, and they would scramble for it, and so I would see the girls that would always lose out, so I would throw it as far as I could to get the girls, but then the boys would uh, take them away. Uh, when I got there, uh, 
I was called out and uh, an officer asked me if I could type and I said yes and then he said well sit down here and he gave me a typewriter and I remember what I typed on it which was a line of poetry instead of the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog or whatever it is uh, what I typed out was I a stranger and afraid in a world I never made the officer just looked at it and didn't say a word. I went back to uh, my tent and the next morning uh, they put five of us on a truck and headed north um, and got to the bottom of a very high mountain and uh, a Catholic chaplain came by and he said, well, the media makes it all very bloody, but it really isn't like that. I didn't know where I was. And he said, uh, over the top of the hill is the front lines. And I said, oh my gosh. And then a, a young man came and took all five of us uh, up the, the mountain and we walked up the mountain and about three quarters of the way up I saw a large uh, bundle looks like it of clothing uh, on some barbed wire and I said what's that and the guy responded that's a chink that's on the that died on the barbed wire and when summer comes, they'll throw napalm on him and burn him. And uh, I said, my, you know, and I kept going up, going up. Uh, then there was another one that was partially, uh, uh, you could see it was a body. And uh, the birds, uh, these big blackbirds would come and pick at it. And liquid would come out and then these huge rats about the size of a cat would come up and, and nip, gnaw at it. Uh, got to the very top. Uh, the officer came out and he looked at us and he looked at me. Uh, my skin is a little bit different than the typical white kids. So he said, are you Puerto Rican? I said, no, sir, I'm not Puerto Rican. He said, good, because Puerto Ricans are no damn good. I lost respect for that officer right after that. He was maligning a whole group of people that didn't deserve that. And um, I never saw that officer come around and inspect our weapons. I never saw him again. Uh, he never came to look at the firing positions that were done. In fact, he never came out of his bunker. So I had lost all respect for him. I, I just uh, didn't like him. The mountain was called White Horse, and uh, a battle had raged there for 10 days. When they talk about the Koreans, it was Koreans versus North Koreans. And it's similar to the idea or the concept of Americans fighting Americans. People have to understand that. Um, the South Koreans uh, lost that mountain, went back up, took it back out. Over, over 10 days, it was the South Koreans that fought for that mountain on those total 10 days and at the end of 10 days they were still on top and uh, I had a lot of respect for them. You mentioned earlier when you were going up the mountain that um, the bodies were identified as Chinese. Now you said that the North and South Koreans are fighting each other. Were there Chinese soldiers there also? Um, I don't know the nationality of the bodies that I saw. Uh, I assume they were Chinese uh, because that's already uh, close to uh, November because I spent uh, Thanksgiving on the 
on uh, on that mountain. Uh, it was called White Horse, mm -hmm. a very famous uh, hill. Uh, and the reason, uh, I don't know if it's in the archives or not, but uh, they used to uh, augment units by grabbing people from other units. So maybe the five of us that were there were um, part of that augmentation to another unit. I, I really don't know uh, because when we came off, uh, it was a different officer that we saw as company commander. What unit were you in? I'm sorry? What unit were you in? Uh, it was uh, the 7th Regiment um, uh, Love Company. I don't remember the officer's name, the captain who was in charge, and a lieutenant. Uh, the lieutenant, uh, I had some concerns about him. I believe in your bio, I believe you said that was the uh, 3rd Infantry Division. I'm sorry, I forgot the division. <laughs> it was the 3rd Division, 7th Regiment. I don't remember the battalion and then the uh, uh, Love Company. This uh, White Horse Mountain is in the uh, Chorwan Valley area. Is this is this north of the DMZ? Uh, do, it's north north of uh, well, I don't really really can't say because I was a PFC, so information is not shared with PFC. <laughs> they don't they don't tell you. Actually, they don't want you to know a lot of those things because if you're captured, uh, in you actual fact, know. they don't they don't tell us anything at all. In leadership school, they always said, "Be sure that the men on your left that you tell who the who your who the men is on your left, and who's on your right." When I got in it, the reality was, forget it. That everything was rumors. Um, my second assignment on the line was in the Chorwan Valley, um, a very wide valley that's been used uh, often as a um, invasion route. Um, high mountains on either side and the Chinese in front of us on one side in a very high mountain. Uh, they were masters of camouflage. We never saw anything that looked like there was um, um, an enemy on those mountains. On, on the other hand, we would dig the foxholes and the trenches and throw the dirt right over the side. So it was very obvious where where we were. We were terrible at those things. <clears throat> would think you would get a little bit better about that. What's that? I would think you would get a little better about that as time went on. No. You, you were <laughs> making yourself evident to the enemy. Um, well, I, I was not in charge, and I, you know, I, uh, and I, I think back in those days, I just didn't agree with a lot of stuff that went on. Can you tell me, what was a typical day in the combat zone? I, I, this is in the middle of the winter, I understand. What was a typical day? What, what was it like for you? Uh, on White Horse, it was periodic um, shelling from both sides and uh, airplanes. Uh, at that time, it was, um, uh, they were still using the propeller driven one. They would dive in on the mountain on the other side and, um, <clears throat> and bomb it. Um, we could see them coming in for the dive. Uh, the Chinese were very, very good with their mortars. Um, <clears throat> they would um, uh, th they would shell the mountain um, if they could see more than uh, a couple of men together. But the trenches were almost six feet deep, so uh, we would walk ar along the trenches never up uh, above it uh, to hurry up and get to uh, to Chow. Uh, and uh, I met the, the um, uh, Puerto Rican that the officers uh, didn't like and the Puerto Rican had shot himself in the foot in order to get a million dollar wound and go home but uh, what they did is patch him up and send him back up and uh, 
he went on that uh, leave that they sent him to Japan and he came back with all brand new clothes and uh, pictures of uh, himself and, and the horse in Japan and was showing him around and then when it came time for dinner uh, he decided that um, he wasn't going to get his clothes dirty on the trench so he got up out of the trench and went up over the mountain where he became a silhouette. Uh, Chinese hit him with one round. That's all it took, one shell, and he disappeared, just disappeared. And, uh, uh, you know, that wasn't a typical day. Hmm. Most of the time it's just periodic shelling back and forth, and we were in the trench, so they, they were no casualties. And down in the in the Chowan Valley, it was the same thing, periodic shelling, until one night when they attacked. I take it that this, are, this is a static situation. You've got trenches, you've got foxholes, you're not advancing toward no. an objective. It's basically a stationary standoff? No. Um, the orders had come down from the top at that time. Um, I didn't hear that as a rumor. I read it afterwards in reading books about the Korean War mm -hmm. that um, the orders were that there was to be no actions above a battalion level. And uh, it was during the armistice period. They were trying to keep casualties down. And so uh, it was just a stalemate and boring, very boring. And, uh, you eat and climb the trenches and you go to sleep in the bunkers. Are you on guard duty a lot? Uh, we were on patrol a lot. Patrols, okay. And uh, they would, uh, at that time, they didn't send officers on patrol, just the sergeant and the men. And uh, we had this uh, Creole sergeant from Louisiana and uh, we were go to we were supposed to go to Point Charlie, and he would get us take us down the mountain, and walk a few paces and come up to another area, and call back and say we we're at Point Charlie, and then uh, we would sit there, and uh, every once in a while he would say, well I, I hear a noise at such and such, and then he'd give the uh, coordinates. And one time, uh, he gave the wrong coordinates, and the shell started coming on us. And he's yelling. He said, "No, no!" But after that, uh, they realized what was going on. So, uh, an officer was sent out with us every time we went out on patrol. Sorry. Uh, you alluded to uh, an incident in the Chorwan Valley? Yes, uh, in, in front of the line was uh, a large lump, I guess, <laughs> or a mound of uh, uh, earth that was uh, used as a listening post. And uh, every night there'd be a squad of men would go out and uh, sit there to see what they could hear or see. and. But uh, you can't see very far. Uh, in, uh, up in, in the war zone, there are no city lights that bounce off light. So it is so dark that if you put your hand out there, you can't see your hand. And uh, I was asleep in a foxhole. And uh, I guess the ground was wet making it easy for them to pick up the barbed wire that was in the front of us and lay it down and then one of them would lay over the barbed wire and the rest would crawl up in the top. But at the very first thing that I heard was uh, I had my back toward uh, in the foxhole, my other body was next to me, and then a grenade exploded and threw me forward and all the rocks and everything hit the, the helmet and the vest. And I turned around and there was a Chinese soldier uh, running uh, 
towards our foxhole um, very fast and uh, I turn with my M1 and empty the clip at him. Either I missed him or uh, he was drugged and, and just uh, running, but he didn't fall. And uh, then I grabbed a carbine that was in the hole and I fired a burst at him and he fell about five yards uh, from the foxhole. My buddy had either been blown out of the hole or got up out of the hole and he was on the side of the foxhole with one knee down on the ground, his rifle pointing up in the air, yelling fire, 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 like a man yelling um, help, help, help. Uh, he never fired his weapon. Um, he was just um, uh, uh, frozen in fear. And uh, I don't blame him. Uh, what uh, my response was nothing more than my training. I had gone through so much of this training that you automatically turn and fire. And I was the first one to fire. And when I did, uh, the other men started firing. And uh, the famous uh, BAR, which the automatic rifle is, is a, a fearsome weapon. And uh, the Marines have three to a squad, and we only have uh, one. And uh, that thing started firing. and. Um, uh, it, it's, it's a pretty nasty weapon. At the same time, the, there's a phone in the foxhole called an Easy 8 where you whistle into it in order to have the other guy pick it up. I heard the whistle, I picked up the phone, and they said, hunker down in the hole because we're going to fire on you. And then the barrage came in, mortars, 50 calibers, 30 calibers, I have no idea if there were artillery, but I, it was just a, a huge uh, barrage of fire right on our uh, LP position that lasted until daylight. Uh, at daylight, I, uh, uh, I got up out of the hole and went over and turned over the man I had uh, killed, and I found his wallet. There was no blood on him. He just looked terribly white. And I opened the wallet, and there was a picture of him with a hair uh, holding a violin. And uh, yeah, that's very sad. W were you injured from this? Uh uh, grenade. Can you repeat the question? Sure. Were you injured from this grenade? Your your buddy was out of the foxhole, I believe. Uh, w were you injured? Was he killed? Was he injured? Uh, what happened was I. I began to taste a uh, salty liquid in my mouth and uh, it was my own blood from a cut uh, underneath my nose and um, uh, when I went back to the bunker which was daylight my lip was really swollen and the officer uh, came in to debrief me uh, as to what had happened and I started shaking and I shook so hard that I couldn't hold my knees down. My knees were going just like this. Uh, I had gone into shock and he kept questioning me about it. Uh, he never sent me to an aid station. Uh, I don't know if he ever recorded it but uh, um, a few weeks later uh, an officer came from 
from headquarters. I didn't know uh, what it was, and they were looking for uh, men who had been in recent combat. And uh, since every unit uh, reports uh, at the end of the day what has taken place, uh, because they have to resupply them with a number of shells and ammunition, um, there's a daily report that's now in the archives. And um, <clears throat> he came, and I was sent up uh, with uh, my buddy on the foxhole. Um, I don't know why the officer decided that just the two of us would be interviewed. Uh, the officer was from Glendale, and he looked at us. And uh, because of my training in the leadership school, I had made sure that I was very clean and shaven and pressed and uh, my own pressing with a little bit of hot water. And uh, the other guy was still uh, in his fatigues and not looking very sharp. And the officer selected me. And a few days later I got a letter and with my orders to to head to this unit. I didn't know what the unit was. It was all in code. And uh, they didn't provide the transportation except from the line to the next level. And from there I had to hitchhike with whatever whoever was going south. And finally got to Seoul. I uh, got off the train station. And um, I burly master sergeant with big chest comes up, where the hell have you been? <laughs> I said, well, I had to find my own way home. <laughs> so, so he said, put me in the Jeep, and then we went to uh, uh, a, a small uh, detachment somewhere in town, and uh, I found out it was the honor guard. And uh, <clears throat> and uh, um, spent the rest of my military career there. Uh, I was uh, right outside the door from General Taylor sometimes. Sometimes I was downstairs in the front door. So I often heard things that uh, I probably shouldn't have, but couldn't help it. What was General um, Taylor's position? Huh? What was General Taylor's position? Was he the division commander? He was the commander commanding or was general for the 8th Army. The 8th Army commander? Yeah. Okay. He was the 8th Army man. Uh, he had a trailer uh, near the building. I was told that the uh, campus was uh, the University of Seoul, but I'm not certain because, as I said, I'm just a PSC. <laughs> and, and they don't tell me anything except go here, go there. Um, in fact, when we went up to the Chowan Valley, uh, they gave us this great feast, uh, steak and apple pie and everything. I smelled a rat right away. I said, I know something's gonna be coming up. And then uh, we, we were told to muster outside and to tear off our uh, um, third division patch from the field jackets. And then I saw enlisted men going around and blackening out all the numbers on the jeeps. And then uh, they got us up on the trucks and they drove north. And after a while the trucks stopped and we got off and started walking. And we marched uh, a good distance to get up to the Chowan Valley and uh, the officer uh, some of the some of the guys went up uh, on the, on the mountain on the one side, but the rest of us were spread out in the valley, and I was one that was spread out in the valley, and I got into this foxhole that had a, a roof over it with sandbag, and I told the guy I tapped him and I said I'm your replacement, and he came out and, and left. He didn't say a word. He just he just took off and. And then uh, I'm sitting there when a Chinese loudspeaker comes out and uh, it, it said, um, MacArthur said you would be home for Christmas. Where are you now, you Yankee dog? And I thought, oh my. And then in your honor, 
Um, oh, no, he said, oh, welcome to such and such and the third division. I mean, they, they knew exactly what was taking place. And it's no wonder, because we had Koreans as laborers and ammo carriers, and I'm sure some of those were uh, the spies. But um, he welcomed us, and then he said, and in your honor, we're going to play White Christmas. And of course, they played White Christmas, and it just reverberated all over the mountains. You could hear the echoes. And it took some time before the American loudspeaker came on, and they said something in Korean, and then they played a song that was very famous for generations that the Koreans love called Aidi Dong. It's a story of a boyfriend going over seven hills looking for his uh, love. That's what I was told. <laughs> Okay, uh, a couple of other questions. Do you have any specific incidents uh, that you can remember while you were on the honor guard and uh, and bodyguard for General Taylor? There's some other some than that, that selection that that day. Uh, I have no idea. Hmm. I was never told. And then um, I used to uh, run the projector, which I I knew how in a unit and would show movies and then um, uh, the captain who had just come on um, saw an arrangement of the uh, uniform that we had uh, in the um, supply room and he said who, who did this and I said I did and then he said okay you're the supply sergeant and then I was a supply sergeant, and then when he saw me that evening running the projector, he came up to me and says, what are you, the all-American boy? <laughs> and so he took me off uh, guard duty, and I didn't uh, do guard duty at all. But I remember very clearly when you're posted outside the building at the front entrance, that the general would come down and then go go down the stairs and then go across to another room where he would be briefed on what happened the night before. And it was the only time that he did not have a bodyguard with him. There was always somebody that would be with him. And we had the same type of uniform that he wore. He wore a camouflage scarf and then uh, we had no insignias, no ranks or anything. So when he got out the car, and we were all about the same size, uh, if you wanted to, to shoot at him, well, you couldn't, you couldn't decide who was he, uh, because we all had the same things. And it would baffle officers who, uh, I would go up to him and say, uh, uh, General Taylor has ordered uh, a parachute which they would use to cut the scarves for, because they were camouflaged. And uh, the officer would look at me and say, who the hell do you think you are? And, and I said, just call General Harkins and he'll explain it to you. General Harkins would get on the phone and he would read him the riot act. The officer would be standing at attention. <laughs> the humor that's in, that exists, you know? I would drive off with the stuff that they had told me to get. <laughs> Were you awarded the Purple Heart for your uh, shrapnel injury? No. That Not seems strange. I, the officer that, that uh, as I said, I, I had some reservations about that officer uh, because uh, he left immediately after the uh, firing. I don't know what he wrote up. Um, I do know that uh, when all of the fighting, all of the shelling and everything was over, all the bodies in front of us, that he comes up with a relief column and stretchers, and he goes up to the very front, pulls out his 45, holds it straight out like this, and fires. What in the hell is he firing it? Everything was over. It was gone. Um, when we went out on patrol one time, we came up to, I think was a berm of a road, and I was uh, uh, 
the guy with um, um, the scope to see at night and um, and a carabine. So I would go and so, and we would move forward and he'd be behind me with a radio man. And then when we got to that scope, well, you would uh, silhouette yourself right up on, on top, which was not a good idea to go uh, beyond that. And he looks at me and he says, Hernandez, uh, go up over the hill. I, I thought about it, I looked at him and I said, after you, sir. He didn't go up. So I had my reservations about that officer. <laughs> Good on you. Okay, when and why did you separate from the military? Why? And when and why? From the military? Right. Uh, my enlistment was up. Um, we were asked after leadership school if we wanted to proceed into officer training and uh, you had to sign up for an additional I think it's either four years or two more years I don't remember but uh, I was not about to sign up uh, it, it was not my profession and uh, I wanted to get back to what I was doing I was starting college and So your two-year enlistment was up. So this would have been February of... Uh, 1954. 54. Well, Art, do you have any reflections or comments about serving your country in, in combat in wartime? For me, yeah. uh, I think it turned me from, uh, from a youngster into a man. And... I think it was one of the most wonderful experiences in my life, and yet I wouldn't want my grandsons to go through it. Uh, I think we all want to live in peace and raise our families and, and do our work. I don't think anybody wants to fight. I think we're provoked into it. and. Uh, once leading some educators through our colleges that came from Latin America, there was a group that came from, I think it was Venezuela. They were high level educators, like secretaries of education, and there were about 10 or 15 of them. But with them was a colonel. And uh, so I asked them one day, now that you've toured the college and is there something that you want to do that you haven't been able to do because they're leading you around by your nose and everywhere? They said, yes, we want to go shopping. I said, okay. Um, I told the driver to take them to the Fox Hill Mall and uh, they went and shopping and the colonel sat in a booth. So I said, well, I'll go find, talk to that colonel. So I started talking to him, and he started telling me in Spanish that when we had two million, under, uh, two million men under arms, that the world respected us. He said, now you're just shit. Hmm. I looked at him and I said, God almighty, can you imagine somebody from a country that whose uh, military budget is so small, it dwarfs, it's dwarfed by the Americans. Having a thought like that. So I still believe, like Mr. Reagan did, or President Reagan, um, trust by verify, but uh, be sure that you stay yourself uh, armed because you never know who some of these nuts are gonna come out of the woodwork. And we have at least two of them now. The guy in North, North Korea and that idiot down in the Middle East. Absolutely. All right, sir, you're, you're two years in the Army are over. You're still a young man, so tell us about the rest of your life. Uh, the first thing I did was to uh, apply for uh, a job because jobs were hard to find. Um, 
the war industries were dying down, um, and uh, racial prejudice was still very prevalent, and um, it was very hard for me to find a job. And so I applied for the police department. Uh, I still have uh, notice that I placed uh, 108th on the list, and uh, it took a long time for them to respond. In the meantime, I went back to community college, uh, and by that time I was on the third year already at UCLA, so I just forgot about the police department. But during those periods when I was unemployed, I would go down to the Red Cross and uh, sell my blood, which had a very strong iron content for $30. And and uh, that's how how I got by during those t uh, months before I went back to college. Did you use the GI Bill to go to UCLA? Yes, mm -hmm. and that is a godsend. Uh, I hope that uh, they could have that for every young young person, but they should do some kind of service. They they shouldn't get it for free. So you got a degree from UCLA. What was your major? I was a fine, and, uh, fine arts and applied arts major. Um, and uh, I got a BA degree and went to teach. Uh, I got also the teaching certificate for an extra year and uh, started teaching in uh, junior high school then uh, my twin, br my my brother, who was a a twin of another brother, uh, had kidney failure and uh, was terminal. So I moved to Selmar and was very lucky to be hired at Selmar High School by the principal and uh, remained there for five years until I applied for a Fulbright uh, scholarship and was surprised when I was interviewed for the Fulbright and even more surprised when I was told that, that I had received it and that I was going to go to England and I thought, oh my. So I told my wife, uh, we're going to go to England uh, what do you think? And she just answered with one sentence. Whether thou, um, whether thou goest, I will go. <laughs> so, so we went. What school did you go to? What what school in England? What school did you go to? Um, over there, it was a school called Barnsley Holgate that had been in existence since the 15th century. They were, uh, they were sending scholars and, uh, and uh, engineers when we were still fighting Indians. Yeah. It was a, a very distinguished school that enrolled the upper 20% of the population up to age 19. Uh, the boys wore a uniform, which was a blazer with uh, insignia, and um, the masters, as they call them, wore their commencement gowns um, uh, to teach in, and uh, a very formal, formal process. Uh, the students wait outside the door because they have to be invited to come into the classroom. Wow. And they must be in good order in order to be invited. And on my very first day, the bell rang and nobody came in. I said, what the hell? What happened? I didn't know about that tradition. So I went next door and I asked my, my colleague, Barry, I said, did you forget to tell me something? Oh, yeah. He says, go outside and invite them in. I went outside and did a military inspection, and I said, okay, you can come in now. 
and, and the boys were um, absolutely hilarious. Um, one day I said, um, we're going to go on a field trip. And um, they said, do we have to wear our uniforms? I said, no, it's a field trip. You can wear whatever you want to. Came the day of the, fire, uh, the field trip. The boys showed up with everything you can think of. A woman's fur coat, a helmet. I mean, they were just outrageous. And I couldn't, I couldn't help but laugh. And so we boarded the bus anyway, and that's the way we went. The headmaster heard about it, and he came to see me, and he says, Mr. Hernandez, one of the traditions here is that the boys are to wear their school uniforms. I said, yes, Mr. Smith, I agree. I think it's a good idea. <laughs> but um, all semester long, they surprised me. And uh, as he says in one of the letters that he, he sent to the superintendent here, uh, a group of the parents' association uh, invited me to speak before them, and, uh, and I did. And afterwards, they uh, asked me, for an hour and a half, nothing but questions. And one of the questions was, how do you keep that marvelous tan you have? <laughs> um, and it was a wonderful experience. It was like going to college all over again. I visited all kinds of schools. Uh, I asked about all sorts of uh, 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 equipment and uh, their curriculum, uh, everything. Uh, and uh, was the Fulbright scholarship one year or two years? It's one year. Mm -hmm. And um, when uh, uh, President Kennedy was a, a president here, um, he had been edu uh, gone to England to uh, on a school there. And uh, he uh, apparently had a lot of fun because his uh, headmaster wrote that that young man uh, needs to <laughs> his libido or something <laughs> has to be controlled. <laughs> <laughs> so when he heard that some English uh, students were touring the White House, he said, oh, invite him to the White House, I mean to the Rose Garden, and give, give him some lemonade and cookies. and. So he went downstairs and uh, uh, told jokes with him and laughed with him as he was. And uh, when he got back to England, uh, the Queen Mother said, um, well, we have to reciprocate and we have to do it at a high enough level. Well, ever since, the Fulbrights that go to England are invited to have tea with a member of royalty at one of the palaces. And my wife and I uh, were uh, honored enough to go along with the others. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had, I think, uh, strawberries and cream at the palace. And uh, I, of course, I'm uh, coming from my background, I, I'm, I was so opposed to royalty and all of that. So when she came out, uh, I think it was Princess Marima, uh, they rolled up this red carpet, two butlers in white tail, I mean tails and uh, white, white ties. They rolled up this carpet and they rolled down the stairs onto the lawn. And I turned to my wife and said, is that really necessary? And she said, yes, uh, she's wearing high heels and the lawn is soft, so if she steps on it, the heels will go down. I said, oh. And again, I opened my big mouth and like they told us in our orientation, keep your mouth shut and your ears open. <laughs> All the way across, that was the, the number one advice um, to us. Well, it sounds like your year in England was a, was a great experience. So after that, you're you back to Silmar High School. What what's that? What's after the scholarship? No, the letter that uh, the headmaster wrote to the superintendent was such a 
a glowing letter that when I went to the school, my principal said, don't even bother on unca- un- unpacking, they want you downtown. So the rest of my career was spent uh, in administrative or quasi-administrative position in various facets of uh, of Los Angeles Unified. After 15 years with them, I was then a a special assistant to an area superintendent. And um, I was recruited by the president of East LA College to join his staff. And um, I left the district and joined the community college and, and spent the next years until my retirement in '91 at uh, on the community college. Sounds like a marvelous career in uh, education and administration, or both. Thank you. Um, did you s- receive any sp- special honors along the way while you were working for the district or for the um, the schools? Um, not really. I don't know if they if they have any. Um, I don't know if anything special that they do for anyone uh, other than promotion. Well, that was good. You did. A, you had a. Sounds to me like you had an absolutely uh, outstanding career, and was certainly always well thought of. You mentioned early on that somehow you seemed to show leadership characteristics right in the basic training they give you a, s- a specific course for leadership you were picked seemingly out of uh, almost at random to be in the honor guard uh, you always were in a position of, of leadership and obviously you responded uh, I, I've always appreciated uh, that leadership course very much uh, it was it was a wonderful experience. Well, Art, could you could you tell us a, a little bit about your family? Um, yes, as I said, I was uh, I was married uh, when I was twenty one, and my uh, first wife sent me a dear John letter. Um, she, I did see her when I came out of the service for one evening when she came to pick me up at the airport. And uh, she asked me if I was going to go home with her, and I said, thank you for the ride. And I got out of the car and went into my mother's home, and I haven't seen her since then. Um, I met my wife uh, while I was still um, looking for work. What she saw in me, I I have no idea, but... um, we went together for a couple of years and then got married. Uh, I have five daughters. Five daughters. Um, and uh, nine, nine grandsons and one adopted granddaughter. Um, Any great grandchildren? Any great grandchildren? Yes. Um, I have uh, one um, great grandson, uh, one great granddaughter still on the way, still uh, still coming down, <laughs> and one already a few months old. Art, do you have any other comments about your your overall life and life experiences? Anything that you would like to be included in this interview? Um, well, um, I can't remember ever being bored through this whole experience called life. Uh, and the other is that uh, I don't uh, have anything against all those experiences that, that might have been negative. In fact, they were all positive and um, and now as I'm coming towards the end of it, um, it's been a very exciting life. Well, Art, 
Thank you for participating in the Veterans History Project. Thank you for your service to your country. Thank you for sharing your stories. And thank you for your service to, to your community for all of these years. Thank you very much.